glasses are blinking up. Good morning, everyone. It is my honor to open the 11th meet, um, hearing of the 186th regular session of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights entitled Rights of Haitian Mi Migrants in the United States, which was requested by the following organizations. Transnational Legal Clinic, University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School. Human Rights Clinic, University of Miami, School of Law. Immigration Clinic, University of Miami, School of Law. Alternative Chance and Haitian Bridge Alliance. Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti. My name is Margaret May McCauley, President of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, Rapporteur for Afro-Descendant Peoples and Against Racial Discrimination. Well, actually, Against Racism. That's the correct title. And I am also the Rapporteur for Older Persons. I am joined this morning by the second Vice President and Rapporteur of, for the United States, Commissioner Roberta Clark, the, the Rapporteur of Haiti, um, Commissioner Strado Rallon, and the Rapporteur for the Rights of Migrants, Commissioner Howell Hernandez. Um, and also present at the hearing, uh, the Executive Secretary, Tanya Bruno, it, yes, she's there. I couldn't see you. The Deputy Executive Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Polido, and the Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Munoz. I begin with a cordial greeting to the August representatives of the state, and happy greetings for the requesters civil society who are here present. I also greet you all in the audience here present and those who are following these proceedings online. Let me explain the distribution of time. And I have to say today, we had some difficulties yesterday which messed up our time completely. So today I have to be very strict with time. So I hope you will assist me in this regard. For civil society, who would start 18 minutes. For the state, 18 minutes. For the commission, 18 minutes. And comments, finishing, um, closing statements from civil society will be nine minutes. And from the state, nine minutes. And closing comments from the commission, three minutes. So with that, I invite civil society to commence their statements. Good morning, Madam President and Commissioners. My name is Megan Williams, and on behalf of the University of Miami School of Law, the Human Rights Clinic, we thank you for this important hearing. With me today are my fellow clinic interns, our director, and our partners, including Haitian National Bridge Alliance, the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School Transnational Legal Clinic, Alternative Chance, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, and Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Today, we are here to speak upon the pressing issue of the United States' persistence in deporting individuals to Haiti, despite calls from the international human rights community to ensure the right to non-refoulement for all Haitian nationals for whom the forced return to Haiti presents grave risk to life, personal security, and health. I now turn to Gerlene Joseph from Haitian Bridge Alliance to speak further on this issue. Thank you so much. Good morning, Madam President, commissions, and US government. Thank you for being here. 
on behalf of all those who have been mistreated, abused, we sit before you to plea and demand and acknowledge and all accountable those who continue to use deportation, abuse against women, children, and extremely vulnerable people. We do understand when it comes to people in mobility, people who are in forced displacement, seeking for safety, seeking for protection, Big Brother might be a good chance for them. And we do understand the relationship between Haiti and the United States and the need for true allyship and making sure what we call external violence upon Haiti in the act of deportation must stop. You will hear videos, voice messages of men who have been deported, taking from their families, for example, Pierre Pierilus, who was not born in Haiti, but came to, his, to, to the United States with his family at the age of four, was raised and became a US, uh, an American without the legal paperwork to identify him as so. After a long life in the United States, he was deported forcefully to Haiti, a place he wasn't born, he has never been to for the first time, in shackles, forced, while I was literally on the phone with him at 2 a.m. in the morning. We contacted his congressman, who then was trying to reach out to ICE and people within the government without any chance of stopping him from being deported. What we see, and we continue to witness, even as we were trying to close Black History Month, a deportation flight was sent to Haiti. And we are asking for accountability. We are asking for a stop to all deportation to Haiti, as we understand and we know, and the US government knows the critical moment we are going through in Haiti right now. You have the information. To deport people to Haiti right now is unconscionable. So we must work together to come up with solutions that will protect human rights, human dignity, and looking for ways <clears throat> to make sure we find the right solution. Paul recorded his testimony today, this week in a space where he has been in hiding for the past two years. Unfortunately, last week, in the midst of all those turmoil, his very home where he was been hiding was burned down. He barely escaped. So he was able to go back there to record his testimony, to share his story, so we can understand what we continue to do as a country is unacceptable, is, is human rights violation, is violence against Haiti as a country, as a state, and upon the people of Haiti itself. We will go ahead and pass to this, the testimony of Pierre Pierilis, who by all means grew up, raised in the norms of the United States, but deported to Haiti once again, a place he wasn't born in, was never been to, but been forced to hide until today. My name is Paul Perlis. At the time of my deportation, I have never stepped foot in Haiti. I did not speak Haitian Creole. My entire family, my siblings, my parents, all my loved ones that I care about are in New York. I was born in St. Martin to Haitian parents. I attribute much of who I am to my parents' belief in love, kindness, and hard work. When I was five years old, my father brought my brother and I to the United States. We settled in Spring Valley, New York. And a few years later, my mother and sister joined us. In 2004, the United States initiated a deportation proceeding against me because of a criminal conviction for sale of a controlled substance. I successfully completed my sentence 
I thought I was going home. Instead, I was immediately taken to ICE jail in Batavia, New York. Every day I woke up not knowing what was going to happen to me. I had no idea if I would be detained for one year or if I would be detained for 10 years. During that time, I did everything I could to fight my immigration case, but a final order of removal was entered against me. I worked to get multiple letters and documentation from the French and Haitian council and embassies, proving I did not have French or Haitian citizenships. After about a year and seven months, I was released on detention on August 1st, 2006, on an order of supervision. I felt legally I was safe. For 15 years, I went to ICE check-ins. For 15 years, I complied with all the conditions of my release. Slowly over time, I started to feel safer. I worked as a financial consultant in New York City, watched sports with friends, had barbecues with family. For 15 years, I just lived my life. Days before the end of the Trump administration, I went to 26 Federal Plaza in Manhattan for what I thought would be a routine scheduled ICE check-in for my order of supervision at 10 o'clock in the morning. Then without any notice or warning, ICE took me into custody and detained me in the back room. I immediately started thinking about my family. I was supposed to watch my godson the next morning. I thought about my meeting schedule the next day. I was supposed to go home. I was forced to abandon all my belongings, my house, my responsibilities, my family. ICE took me to LaGuardia Airport, but they were unable to deport me. I was then transferred to an ICE jail in rural Louisiana. I was detained in Louisiana for three weeks, hundreds of miles away from my family and community. Again, ICE attempted to deport me at the Alexandria Staging Facility, but they uh, failed to do so. After the two previous uh, failed deportations, ICE threatened me with physical harm if I didn't board the Haitian flight. An officer told me, we can do this the hard way or we can do this the easy way. He motioned towards a body restraint device that looked like a straitjacket. All I could think of was the stories of ICE breaking people's bones or beating them and dragging them onto deportation flights. I was worried that they would do the same to me, so I complied. For about six hours, I was shackled at my ankle, waist, and wrist in a dark van alone. The van reeked of urine. There was no air conditioning or ventilation. I told the officers I cannot breathe in here. Please let me out. I was ignored. I asked uh, if I could call my attorney or my family. They refused. From um, the van, they dragged me onto a plane. I was very skeptical and felt uneasy because I knew what was happening to me wasn't right, that it was wrong and illegal. So the flight uh, left early in the morning. We were all shackled. All I could hear is cries from babies and screaming from other people on the flight, men, women, children, and infants. During the flight, I kept replaying over and over the thoughts of how I would be killed as soon as I landed. I was certain that either the ICE agents or the Haitian government would kill me. My heart was racing. I started twitching. My entire body was shaking. When was I going to see my family again? What was going to happen next? When we finally landed, I was the last person to exit the plane. I attempted to show ICE agents again, documents proving that I was not a citizen of Haiti. Five ICE agents then grabbed me and dragged me off the plane. I was later dumped to a local police station. Finally, I was able to get on the phone with my sister, Naomi. She was in a complete panic. She tried to comfort me to tell me, you know, that they're gonna figure something out, but she couldn't hide the terror and the dread in her voice. It was heartbreaking. Since my deportation to Haiti two years ago, I've been forced to live in hiding. I struggle to find food, water, and other necessities. I hear gunshots every night. Every single day, I'm paralyzed with the fear that I'll be kidnapped or killed. Because I'm a deportee from the United States, local gangs will target me. I'm forced to move from different locations every few months, and I'm unable to find work or leave my house regularly. I rarely go out and rely on my faith for hope. I stopped even going to a church. I'm constantly questioning why is this happening and how could this happen? The U.S. government took me from my family without warning, held me in ICE jails, and relentlessly attempted to deport me until they finally did. There isn't a minute that goes by that I don't fear for my life or my safety. I live in limbo. I miss countless birthdays, barbecues, weddings, funerals. Every day I'm missing my life with my family, my life with my community. Because I'm a person of Haitian descent, the U.S. government stole my life. Freedom for some is not freedom. Thank you so much. I wanted to highlight that I was on the phone with him when they told him if he did that move, it was going to be worse for him. I heard it myself. I also want to highlight that we requested for Paul to be able to come and testify in person, and that request was denied. I also want to highlight that we are yet to receive any proof 
that they were a travel document produced for Paul to be able to be deported to Haiti. And at the time, which our two then the, the, the Haitian government requesting for what type of document was provided in order for the US to deport Paul to Haiti, we have still not received anything. The, U, the Haitian ambassador to the US himself told and tweeted, we did not provide any documentation to allow Paul to be deported to Haiti because at the time he was not identified as a Haitian citizen. Thank you so much. The next testimony we will present is from Laura McMaster, the wife of Patrick Junley, an individual deported to Haiti last year. Um, when I found out that he would be deported, um, quite frankly, I was very afraid because I didn't know what to expect with him going back to Haiti and not having any family members there or anyone else. And, um, you know, like sad at the same time, confused, um, because I know that at that point I would be left alone, you know, without my husband. A lot of problems in ICE custody, you know, with him getting sick, not getting proper medication or medical treatment. Um, at times I didn't hear from him for days at a time because of the phone service or you know, them just locking down units and facilities and knowing that he wasn't getting proper medical treatment. At times, you know, I was very afraid myself because I thought um, there were points in times where, you know, like I would never be able to see my husband again. He did um, challenge his deportation multiple times. We sent in multiple different papers, you know, habeas corpuses, different things like that, but they all just came back the same. It was as if no one was listening or hearing. When Patrick got off the plane, the Haitian um, government um, detained him, the Haitian police, and they told Patrick that he was being detained because he was a criminal. But Patrick had never been in Haiti since he was about three or four years old. Um, his uncle had signed him out. And when he got to the car, that's when the Haitian police came and they told him he had to come back inside. Uh, Patrick stayed there for quite a couple of um, weeks. And the Haitian, I guess, uh, Police were asking for, you know, ransom money for him to be released. And um, because we didn't come up with the money, after a couple of weeks, they told him that he was going to be released, meaning that um, Haitian police, um, and they brought, the Haitian police had brought Patrick to National Penitentiary and told him that's where he was going to stay. Um, they, the police said that he was going to see a judge in a couple of days, but it had been weeks and he had never seen anyone. And that's when the Haitian um, police started asking for more money. I believe Patrick was in there for about three to four months. Um, Patrick didn't have any access to any of his medications that he was taken by the facility at National Penitentiary. Um, um, Patrick, when he first got there, he um, to the National Penitentiary, he refused to go inside because he thought he was gonna be released. So they started to beat him with a baton. Um, he did have some high blood pressure and a lot of edema in his lower leg. He wasn't able to walk on his feet and legs but there still was no medical treatment when he was asking for it. Um, it was a time where cholera had came back around and everybody was getting sick and dying. Um, I've seen videos of um, people dying inside National Penitentiary from the cholera. And it was just really crowded, dirty conditions where they were peeing and using the bathroom, you know, in buckets and basically buckets. There was no food. There was no clean water. I had to send someone to... Um, send him clean water and food every day. So I had to pay for it out of my own pocket. Um, you know, the gangs coming in and taking over um, and some of the challenges that he faced. You know, him not being home with his family is one of our biggest challenges where he just feels like depressed all the time. He doesn't really leave outside of the house. Um, you know, there's no jobs, so he doesn't have money to eat. So I have to provide for him as well as my kids and, you know, the bills and things that I have to maintain here. So like, it's just really hard for him, you know, trying to keep him together and letting him know that it's okay. But, you know, he did try to get a passport and an ID. So that way he can maybe try to go to a different area, like a different country that will accept him. So he can have a job and he can, you know, live a life, some type of life, but there's no way of getting out of there. There's no passport. There's no IDs. We've been looking for months and we haven't found any way that can help him, you know, at all. 
Before we hear from Daniel Tse from Haitian Bridge Alliance and Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights to share concluding remarks regarding the systemic anti-black racism within the United States immigration system, we wanted to flag that we have additional pre-recorded testimonies which are included in the materials for the commissioners. However, we do not have the time today to share them. I now turn to Daniel. Thank you. The wrongful deportation of Paul Perez is shocking, but it's not unique. Each day, the United States government targets Haitians and other black immigrants with violence and abuse through its immigration system. The actions of the United States violate the American Declaration of Human Rights, including the rights to humane treatment and fair civil trial. Now, what happened to Paul happens to thousands of black immigrants in the United States every day. I can attest to this because I was also detained by the US immigration authorities for about nine months when seeking protection after I left my home country, Cameroon. The United States targets Haitians and other black immigrants for criminal pros prosecution on the basis of race. Black people in the United States are 2.5 times more likely to be arrested than whites. And though they are less than 6% of the undocumented population, they make up more than 20% of the immigrant population facing detention and deportation on criminal grounds. The double punishment of deportation for what are often minor criminal offenses strikes hard on black immigrants. 76% of black immigrants are deported because of contact with the police and the criminal legal system. The criminal arrest to immigration detention and to the deportation pipeline separates black families and destroys whole communities. The United States kidnaps Haitians and other black immigrants from their home communities and cages them in remote immigration jails in isolated areas throughout the country. The United States uses these immigration jails to deprive detained immigrants from their families, isolating them from supporting witnesses and attorneys. I really okay. in your nine minutes, which you will have later. I really have to keep the time. Thank you, Madam President. Thanks. Um, I now invite the United States uh, delegation to make it 18 minutes. Thanks. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Chair. My name is Frank Mora. I'm the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization of American States. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to meet with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and Civil Society groups in this public thematic hearing. I'd like to welcome uh, my U.S. government colleagues from the Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, who are here today uh, to address this important topic. The United States strongly supports the work of the Commission, and we regard the institution as vital to the promotion and protection of human rights in the Western Hemisphere. Public hearings such as the one we hear today play a key role in the inter-American system to ensure that OAS member states address human rights challenges in their respective uh, countries. We recognize the United States, like all countries, has work to do. The U.S. government is committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons. We demonstrate that commitment through our public statements and through our actions, our commitment to the Inter-American Commission and the system. We'd like to thank civil society for sharing your concerns with us today. As part of my first official engagements outside of Washington as U.S. Ambassador to the U.S., I had the chance to meet earlier this week with Haitian migrants and local service providers in San Diego concerned with the issues before us uh, this morning. And I look forward to engaging on these issues, by the way, later today with the office of the Los Angeles mayor. I will now call on my colleague, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Emily Mandrella from the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs for our first presentation. Thank you, Ambassador. Distinguished commissioners, uh, civil society actors, secretariat staff, and colleagues, good morning, and I thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing on Haiti. Thank you also to civil society for your presentations. I am Emily Mandrela, a deputy assistant secretary in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, 
covering migration issues along with Central America and Cuba. In February of 2021, President Biden directed U.S. departments and agencies to develop a new approach to regional migration that includes strategic efforts to address the root causes of migration, policy reforms at our border, and work alongside regional partners and others to collaboratively manage migration. The United States collaborates with partners across the region and the world to underscore our shared responsibility for migration in the Western Hemisphere. We developed a set of action-oriented priorities to provide protection for those who need it, strengthen humane migration management, increase legal pathways, and provide support for countries and communities hosting large numbers of migrants and refugees. The June 2022 Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, which Haiti endorsed along with 21 other countries, provides a framework for countries throughout the region to build collaborative solutions to advance new policy commitments and share best practices. The United States remains deeply concerned about political, social, economic, and security challenges facing Haiti. We consistently seek to support durable and locally grounded solutions to address those challenges so that Haitians can thrive in Haiti. Prolonged food insecurity, political instability, kidnappings, uneven access to fuel and gang activity challenge Haiti's ability to govern fairly and justly and put our humanitarian and development efforts at risk of failing to reach those who most need our assistance. Several U.S. government programs aim to address these issues in a coordinated fashion. The United States has provided approximately $171.3 million in life-saving humanitarian assistance and early recovery, risk reduction, and resilience programming since 2021. As of January 24th, $60 million has been committed to the humanitarian response, including responding to the cholera outbreak. The funding will also provide urgent food assistance as 4.7 million people face a severe food crisis as well as gender-based violence prevention and response services for the most vulnerable. In early January 2023, the United States expanded a parole process for nationals from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, through which as of mid-February, more than 11,300 Haitians have been thoroughly screened and vetted and received authorization to travel to the United States and stay for up to two years. Our capacity to process individuals through this parole process is growing day on day. After implementation, we saw a marked decrease in the cumulative number of the four eligible nationalities arriving irregularly at the U.S. southern border. The parole process broadly provides an alternative to a regular migration for nationals from those four countries, and we encourage, we encourage Haitians residing in Haiti or throughout the hemisphere to, access, to assess their eligibility and opt for safer options to access the United States rather than the dangerous overland and maritime routes promoted by smugglers. Haitian nationals can visit the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service Creole language website with frequently asked questions about legal pathways available to Haitians. We have seen an increase in the numbers of Haitians attempting to depart Haiti by boat, making the dangerous trip through the Caribbean to Florida or across the Mona Passage to Puerto Rico. We work with partners in the Caribbean to ensure the most rapid and humanitarian, uh, humane repatriation process possible, including funding international organization partners to provide reception and reintegration support. Assistance to repatriated Haitian migrants includes food, water, hygiene, health care, and psychosocial assistance, as well as cash assistance for clothing, transportation, medicine, telecommunications, and school supplies. We understand misinformation and disinformation are a problem, and we work to deliver clear, accurate messages articulating U.S. policy. We amplify these messages through television, radio, and print media stories generated often from interviews with U.S. government officials in Washington, D.C., and at our overseas embassies. I will conclude by underscoring the United States continues to enforce its immigration laws. We encourage people of all nationalities who hope to visit or reside in or unite with family or seek protection in the United States to pursue the growing number of legal pathways to do so. Thank you.
And I will now turn it over to my colleague, Daniel Delgado from Department of Homeland Security. Thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Mandrela. Madam President, distinguished commissioner, civil society organizations, secretariat staff and colleagues, on behalf of the United States Department of Homeland Security, I am grateful for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Daniel Delgado, and I am the Acting Director for Border and Immigration Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. I would like to first set the stage by touching on a number of DHS policies regarding migration to include those related to Haitian migrants, as well as our continued efforts to build a safe, orderly, and humane immigration system. On December 5th, 2022, the Secretary of Homeland Security announced the extension of Temporary Protected Status, or TPS, for Haiti for an additional 18 months from February 4th, 2023 through August 3rd, 2024. Simultaneously, the Secretary also redesignated Haiti for TPS, allowing eligible Haitian nationals residing in the United States as of November 6, 2022 to apply for TPS through August 3, 2024. The extension of TPS for Haiti allows approximately 107,000 current beneficiaries to register to retain TPS until August 3, 2024, while the redesignation will allow an estimated 105,000 additional Haitians Haitian nationals in the United States to apply for TPS. In extending and redesignating Haiti for TPS, DHS conducted a thorough review of country conditions and determined that Haiti meets the statutory conditions supporting its designation for TPS after consultation with interagency partners and careful consideration of extraordinary and temporary conditions in Haiti. These moves together offer temporary status and the ability to work legally in the United States for more than 210,000 Haitian nationals. As previously mentioned, on January 5th, 2023, DHS announced new parole processes for nationals of Cuba, Haiti, and Nicaragua. These processes build upon the success of the process established by DHS for Venezuelans in October. Through a fully online process, eligible individuals and their immediate family members can seek advance authorization to travel to the United States and be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for a temporary grant of parole for a period of up to two years including the ability to apply for employment authorization once they arrive, provided that they meet established criteria, including having a US-based sponsor. Each month, DHS will authorize up to 30,000 qualifying nationals from all four of these countries to come to the United States through this orderly and lawful process. As part of this process, individuals are required to fly into the United States as opposed to transiting to the Southwest border. In just the first several weeks of the process, through February 17th, more than 11,300 Haitian nationals have received authorization to travel to the United States, and more than 5,100 Haitians have arrived safely in the United States through this process. In our efforts to make these processes more accessible to all that qualify, DHS has translated and made available materials in Haitian Creole. By establishing this new process, we're effectively disincentivizing migrants from making a dangerous, irregular journey to our southwest border often putting their lives in the hands of smuggling organizations who are looking to exploit them for profit and further incentivizing individuals to use the safe and orderly processes that we've established. The data show that these processes are working and that when presented with a safe, orderly, and lawful process, individuals will choose this over the dangerous and irregular journey throughout our hemisphere. In addition to these lawful pathways, the U.S. government provides durable solutions for humanitarian protections through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program for applicants who qualify. Maritime migration is something that the department takes very seriously and that we continue to strongly discourage. The vessels used are predominantly in poor, unseaworthy condition and often overcrowded. Such attempts to take to the sea aboard unseaworthy or overloaded vessels is always dangerous and often deadly. When they are at sea, subject to variable weather conditions, they become unstable and may capsize, leaving migrants in the water, often without life preservers or other safety equipment. As our secretary has stated time and time again, the time is never right to attempt migration by sea. The US government's response to maritime migration in the Florida Straits is governed by Operation Vigilance Sentry, as an integrated operating plan describing the organization and structure for the Homeland Security Task Force Southeast to deploy resources and coordinate multi-agency operations. The U.S. Coast Guard routinely interdicts migrants of many nationalities, though Cuban and Haitians remain the top two nationalities that we encounter. Their mission is first and foremost one of safety. To discourage dangerous maritime journeys, 
migrants who are interdicted at sea are generally repatriated to their country of origin or departure unless they establish a credible fear of persecution or torture. Should they establish a credible fear while at sea, they are generally transferred to the Migrant Operations Center at Naval Station Guantanamo Bay, where their claim is assessed on the merits. Migrants who then establish a well-founded fear of persecution or likelihood of torture before a USCIS officer are generally resettled to a third country through a process managed by our colleagues at the Department of State. Maritime migrants who, success, who do successfully reach the U.S. territory are generally placed into expedited removal proceedings and may be removed if they do not establish a legal basis to remain in the country. With that context on key policies and how they relate to Haitians already in the United States and those seeking to come to the United States, I will turn it over to my colleague, Chris Kelly, who will speak about the processes for these non-citizens who do not have a legal basis to remain in the United States and may be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It is an honor to appear before you today on behalf of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. My name is Christopher Kelly, and I am currently the acting head of the ICE Office of Regulatory Affairs and Policy. Ordinarily, when I'm not acting in this role, I am the permanent Deputy Assistant Director for Policy at ICE. I would like to share some relevant information about ICE's treatment and removal of Haitian nationals. First, whenever ICE identifies a non-citizen who is removable from the United States to include Haitian nationals, it conducts an individualized review of the case to determine whether to take enforcement action, and if so, what enforcement action to take. In making such decisions, ICE considers all the relevant facts and proceeds based on the totality of the circumstances. Accordingly, ICE considers myriad factors in making an enforcement decision, including, but not listened, uh, limited to, the nature of the immigration violation at issue, the individual's criminal history or other adverse factors, evidence of positive equities such as family ties, duration of residence in the United States or U.S. military service, evidence of compelling medical, humanitarian, or other similar factors are also considered. If ICE elects to proceed with immigration proceedings against a removable non-citizen, it will also consider whether to detain an individual or whether to release them from custody to include enrollment on some form of alternatives to detention. ICE detains individuals where ICE is prohibited by law from releasing them or where the facts of the case reflect that the individual poses a danger to the persons or property of the United States or where it is determined that no amount of bond or conditions would be sufficient to ensure their appearance at future immigration proceedings. Where an individual will not be detained by ICE, ICE will release them on their own recognizance, on a monetary bond, or on some form of monitoring. Pursuant to existing policy, ICE may also parole individuals found to have a credible fear of returning to their country with or without conditions. Notably, in immigration proceedings, non-citizens may generally request an immigration judge review a custody decision made by ICE, absent uh, limited exceptions. When detained, ICE implements standards that ensure that non-citizens are treated humanely and with respect, protected from harm, have access to necessary care, and can access materials and individuals who may represent them or assist them with their immigration case. ICE has also policies in place uh, that limit when the individual may be transferred to a dissension facility in a different geographic area to ensure that non-citizens are not needlessly separated from their respective families and legal representatives. Individuals placed into immigration proceedings have a full and fair opportunity to contest their removal and to apply for forms of relief or protection from removal for which they are eligible. This includes asylum, statutory withholding of removal, or protection under the regulations implementing Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture. By law, decisions on such applications are made on a case-by-case -case basis based on the particular facts of the individual's case and the specific harm they claim they would suffer were they to be removed to their home country. Should the immigration judge find that an individual removable and deny any applications for relief or protection, uh, the individual may appeal the decision to the Board of Immigration Appeals. During any appeal to the BIA, the non-citizen will not be removed from the United States. Should the BIA affirm the decision, the individual may pursue a petition for review to the relevant U.S. Circuit Court and to the U.S. Supreme Court. These courts may stay an individual's removal pending a decision. Moreover, even where an individual has exhausted all forms of judicial review of an adverse removal decision, they may be able to later file a motion to reopen their case based on changed country conditions that render them eligible for relief or protection from removal. The filing of such a motion may stay the individual's removal while it is pending with the court. Additionally, individuals' removal proceedings are free to pursue collateral benefits that may also permit them to remain in the United States either indefinitely or, if some, or for some definite period of time. Such benefits may include temporary protected status, U or T non-immigrant visas, 
And it is also worth noting that an individual with a final order of removal may receive a discretionary stay of removal from ICE on a case-by-case -case basis, which may stay the execution of the removal for some time, uh, period of time. Finally, when ICE removes a non-citizen, it takes steps to ensure that the removal is safe, humane, and appropriately coordinated with the relevant government, interagency partners, and inter international organizations. Before removing a non-citizen, ICE runs various checks to ensure that there is no legal impediment to removal and ensures that the person is medically fit to travel. ICE coordinates the arrival of individuals being removed to Haiti with the Haitian government, who will meet the aircraft to facilitate an orderly repatriation process. Additionally, non-governmental organizations operate a reception center that can help returning individuals meet their basic needs upon their return. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, just on time. Um, I now um, invite my my colleagues and first um, the country rapporteur. You're the U.S. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, and good morning to everyone, to representatives of the civil society. I feel like I know you all very well. Um, because I think we've met a few times this week. And uh, good morning to representatives of the state and, of course, Ambassador Moore. Wonderful to have you here with us and your delegation. Um, my colleague, Com Commissioner Hernandez, is this, the rapporteur with the responsibility for persons in human mobility. And he will um, speak at length on this. But there are some things I wanted to ask for clarification. Um, for the for the on the, the the civil society organizations in relation to because what you presented, um, well not only today but uh, and other here and this this week is what your your perception and I suppose your documentation is on anti-black racism in relation to how Haitians are treated by um, not only uh, the U.S. but by other countries in the transit uh, as Haitians leave situations of desperation and insecurity, extreme situations of desperation and insecurity, as humans will do to get to places of safety. Haitians are leaving Haiti, which we don't have to go into the history of Haiti, but a long history of marginalization and exploitation and insecurity, um, and of course, uh, natural disasters that have compounded um, the experience of poverty and insecurity. So Haitians are leaving as they must, as we all would as human beings, to get safety for ourselves and for our family members and for our children, prospects for, for uh, and opportunities. And in that, you've been outlining um, the extreme um, abuse and violence that you are seeing are disproportionately um, experienced by Haitians and disproportionately experienced by Haitians because of this anti-black racism. And you've made the case again uh, today. So I wanted to ask you in relation to the one of the cases that you spoke about, Paul, I think, who was the, the person who is not Haitian, but was um, deported to Haiti. Uh, I wanted you to outline for, for, for us, if you could, whether or not Paul had any access to um, legal support to, to address the situation that he found himself in being deported to a place that he's not a national, he has no particular, he has no legal connection to. And uh, because, of course, there is a right to access to justice and access to legal support. So what was that like for um, Paul? And uh, for the representatives of the state, I want to thank you uh, for your exposition on the, the, the policy um, in supporting persons to move in fair and orderly and humane fashion. Um, and you spoke about those who are uh, in transit, you know, deterring persons who are in transit in irregular migration. You spoke about those persons who are in Haiti <coughs> and the possibility of legal pathways to leave Haiti to enter the U.S. And you also spoke of those who are already in the United States. And, um, uh, and, and I think it's in that last um, space that I really want to address my questions. Have regard thinking about the situation of Paul here. Um, I guess maybe at a macro level, what I want to ask in relation to the, the allegation that Haitians are being disproportionately deported and disproportionately deported in relation to their numbers there, 
um, in the United States. Do you have any data to respond to this allegation? Data on persons by nationality or by presumed nationality and how um, ICE deals with those persons. And then you spoke about um, uh, the removal that was safe and conducted in accordance with the law. Um, but in this case of Paul, and I know that you probably cannot comment specifically on any one case, but in a situation where someone is a non-national, what is the approach of the, of the state to deportation of someone to a country that there's no, they have no um, legal connection to? Um, and I, I guess I won't ask you to speculate what happened in this scenario, but uh, if you can keep the scenario in mind. Um, so I want to stop here because I know that Commissioner McCauley will remind us we only have 18 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, my dear sister. I now call my brother, Commissioner Rallon, who is the thematic rapporteur for, no, you're the, the other country rapporteur for Haiti. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Un saludo a Sociedad Civil y también a la ilustre representación de Estados Unidos. Eh, yo quisiera, un poco en línea de lo que mencionaba la comisionada Roberta Clark, eh, hacer alguna pregunta de datos que, si bien no los tienen en este momento, nos pueden ampliar después la información por escrito, pero sería muy útil para la comisión, para el análisis de toda esta temática, poder contar con datos que se refieran a un rango de fechas, digamos de 2018 a 2022, de cuán es el número de personas haitianas que han llegado a la frontera sur y respecto de ellos poder hacer un comparativo del número de personas que han recibido algún tipo de protección internacional, así como las que han solicitado el estatus de protección temporal TPS. Digamos, eso nos permitiría tener un, un análisis de la efectividad, por así decirlo, de los distintos mecanismos para una situación tan complicada. Por otro lado, y, y muy brevemente como relator de Haití, y precisamente en el marco de este periodo de sesiones, hemos recibido testimonios de un estado de terror que se vive en Haití, un estado donde hay alrededor de 15 secuestros diarios, donde hay una guerra por los territorios de las pandillas, con las autoridades que no pueden tener los mínimos, digamos, estándares de orden público. Y eso ha generado sin duda una crisis humanitaria. Eh, ante una situación tan extraordinaria, eh, digamos, poder conocer cómo el Estado puede garantizar el cumplimiento del principio de no devolución eh, a toda persona que busca protección internacional ante condiciones tan dramáticas que vive cuando llega al país, que puede estar similar a zona de, de una guerra interna entre las autoridades del Estado y las pandillas, que esa es la realidad a la que se enfrenta una persona que está deportada. Esas serían las preguntas. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I now invite um, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, um, who is the rapporteur um, for the rights of migrants. Gracias. For the rights of migrants. Sorry, my mic was. Gracias, gracias, Presidenta. Quiero saludar aquí a ambas delegaciones presentes, eh, felicitar a las organizaciones de la sociedad civil por el trabajo de documentación que han realizado y la información que trae a nuestra atención. Y quiero reconocer muy especialmente la presencia de la delegación de Estados Unidos eh, de tan alto nivel. Saludo al embajador Mora, representante permanente ante la OEA, pero también integrada con representantes precisamente de las agencias del gobierno de Estados Unidos que eh, trabajan directamente el tema, el tema de migración. Es realmente un tema de enorme preocupación para la Relatoría de Derechos de las Personas en Movilidad Humana, la situación que estamos observando en, en Haití y cómo eh, existen factores que están expulsando cada día más personas de nacionalidad haitana hacia, hacia Estados Unidos. Es un tema que ha estado presente hoy en las intervenciones de la sociedad civil y de mis colegas Roberta Clark y Estuardo eh, Ralón, 
pero es también, lo sabemos, uno de los, de los aspectos más visibles eh, de la migración hoy hacia, hacia Estados Unidos. Eh, viene siempre a mi memoria esas imágenes que nos impactaron tanto del año pasado, de algún oficial de fronteras en caballo, eh, persiguiendo a, a, a inmigrantes afrodescendientes, ¿no? y, y eso provocó enormes reacciones en la, en la opinión pública. Eh, reconozco, la, la relatoría reconoce el derecho soberano que tienen los estados para establecer los requisitos para el ingreso documentado a su territorio. Creo que nadie disputa ese principio básico de soberanía. Pero también sabemos que este derecho soberano está asociado con el cumplimiento de eh, distintas obligaciones de derecho internacional soberanamente asumidas por los estados. Entonces, es ahí en donde es necesario hacer este, este balance. Pero creo que aquí, en nuestra región, eh, hay un elemento fáctico adicional que está presente y es el hecho de que hoy en varios países de origen se están presentando causas que están impulsando de manera creciente la migración. Y una de ellas son las condiciones socioeconómicas, pero otra también son eh, los, eh, eh, el efecto inclusive del cambio climático, la inseguridad que se vive en algunos países y, en, y, y las amenazas que también eh, producen la, los grupos de delincuencia organizada. En ese sentido, yo he escuchado con, con, eh, con eh, optimismo el, la expresión del embajador Mora cuando señala que en la política del presidente Biden está presente atender las causas raíz de la migración. Y creo que ese debe ser un principio toral. Si no se atienden las causas raíz de la migración, no vamos a poder alcanzar el objetivo que Naciones Unidas se propuso hace cinco años de alcanzar una migración segura, regular y ordenada. Ese debiera de ser el fin último. Y esto obliga, creo, a, a que en la región se adopte una política migratoria con un sentido de, rea, de, de realidad pero, eh, sobre las causas de la migración, pero con una perspectiva de derechos humanos. Yo todavía siento que estamos pasando de modelos de control migratorio y que aún no llegamos a un modelo de gobernanza migratoria. Y creo que sí, también te, quiero reconocer que hay esfuerzos importantes para avanzar hacia un modelo de gobernanza en la migración. La declaración de Los Ángeles, precisamente en esta ciudad, suscrita en el marco de la novena cumbre de las Américas, me parece que es una... Es, es una eh, eh, acción en el sentido correcto de avanzar hacia un modelo de migración con una perspectiva de derechos humanos. Creo que hay que acelerar ese paso, hay que avanzar hacia eh, una migración que tome en cuenta eh, las realidades en los estados de origen, de tránsito, de destino, pero también de, de, de repatriación y que a partir de ahí pudiéramos avanzar en desarrollar un principio de responsabilidad compartida pero diferenciada en el tema de la migración. Mientras eso se da, hay una realidad imperante en este tema. Es una constatación que ha hecho la, la Relatoría para Migrantes y es el hecho de que observamos frecuentemente como una, una constante la ausencia de canales regulares y accesibles para la movilidad humana de personas que está obligando a las personas a utilizar mecanismos y rutas aún más alejadas, poco transitadas y peligrosas. Y aquí se mencionaba precisamente las, los grandes riesgos de la, migra, de la migración que se, se hace por, este, por vía marítima. Entonces, eh, eh, este creo que sigue siendo el, el, el punto central de la problemática, la ausencia de estos canales regulares y accesibles para la movilidad humana. También hay que reconocer como algo positivo eh, la extensión del Estatuto de Protección Temporal para personas este, migrantes. Eh, también hemos visto con optimismo el programa eh, 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 Parol para visas auspiciadas eh, para personas haitianas, cubanas, nicaragüenses y venezolanas del 6, del 6 de, de, este de, de febrero. Obviamente no son soluciones completas, 
creo que son eh, medidas que ayudan a avanzar en esta dirección y evitar que las personas acudan a canales eh, peligrosos, como inclusive es el recurso a, a traficantes. Pero, pero mientras avanzamos en esa, en esa dirección, y, y es aquí donde quiero, quiero concluir, me parece que es muy importante que en todos los procesos este, migratorios se tenga en cuenta eh, principios de humanidad básicos. Concretamente lo mencionaba el comisionado Ralón, el principio de non-refulmón. Y, y así como el principio de protección internacional para aquellas personas cuyo regreso forzado a su país de origen las pondría en una situación de extrema vulnerabilidad. Entonces, para poder completar la información de la, de la relatoría, nos ayudaría muchísimo conocer cómo en los procedimientos migratorios que se siguen en Estados Unidos se garantiza el principio de no devolución y se asegura que haya personas que no sean devueltas a sus países en donde su vida corre peligro. También creo que nos ayudaría muchísimo saber cómo se corrigen errores como el de Paul Pierre Luz, en donde claramente no es una persona de, na de nacionalidad este, migratoria. Y esto eh, me ayudaría mucho a entenderlo, cómo se aseguran est estos re respetos a derechos humanos básicos en los procesos de remoción expedita, expedited removal, precisamente por su eh, 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 rapidez, se corre el riesgo de que no haya esta verificación. Concluyo, concluyo también resaltando, eh, a la, la relatoría es muy importante saber cuál es el estatus que hoy tiene la derogación finalmente del título 42, pero también, también saber si eh, la perspectiva de la administración Biden para otro programa que, eh, que ha sido eh, sumamente cuestionado por los, lo, lo, las consecuencias de las personas que son el Migration Protection eh, Pro Protocols. Eh, con esta, con, son muchas preguntas, concluyo, concluyo con, una, con una última. Sería también de mucha ayuda conocer cómo en los procedimientos en, en ICE las personas pueden tener un recurso para eh, denunciar eh, abusos, violaciones a derechos, a derechos humanos. Escuché con, 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 con mucho interés el, el reconocimiento de Estados Unidos al cumplimiento de las obligaciones de la Convención contra la Tortura, cuando se, cuando se, se cometen actos que pueden ser eh, crueles, crueles penas inhumanas a degradantes si existe un mecanismo de denuncia por parte de las personas que se encuentran. Muchas preguntas. Si no tenemos tiempo para contestarlas, mi, este, estamos, la, la Secretaría Ejecutiva está muy cerca del Departamento de Estado, así que siempre pueden, podemos reunirnos para poder completar esta información de un tema que es de la mayor importancia para, para nosotros. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much. I'm in an impossible position with the rest of the, of the, um, table where we have um, about a minute left. Luciana, yes? Yes. And um, that being so, um, I don't, you didn't, in, in, no. Executive Secretary, no. Oh, very quickly, 50 seconds. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Muy buenos días y muchas gracias por participar en esta audiencia tan importante. Muy, muy breve y en conexión con lo que ya ha manifestado el, el comisionado Hernández, sería muy importante también para la Redesca saber de qué manera están implementando esta instrucción del presidente Biden, que refería a la, la representante del Departamento de Estado, de atender a las causas estructurales eh, de la migración. Me parece que es un avance importante y que en casos como, como el de Haití, que vive una emergencia humanitaria, saber las vías en las que efectivamente van, van a implementar esta instrucción sería muy importante para la comisión. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I will withhold my comments and questions for the closing. Um, I now invite um, civil society to make their final statements. Nine minutes. Thank yes. You. Thank you, President McCauley, and thank you to the commissioners, all of you, for um, ensuring that we have a human rights approach to migration. Um, I think when we hear migration management, we lose the humanity and we lose the people behind them and we lose a sight of the actual crisis on the ground in Haiti. 
that people are being deported to. And so I welcome the opportunity to continue to engage with the U.S. delegation on ways to make ongoing migration from Haiti to the United States more humane and more robust so that it actually protects people. Time does not permit me to go into all of the ways in which these programs fail to actually provide the security and access to um, systems of protection that are really needed on the ground. Uh, and I'll defer to my colleagues to speak more about the need for Haitian engagement in these discussions. I do want to note, though, particularly, right, we are specifically talking about people from the United States who are being deported into Haiti who do not have adequate protection. Um, and so the system of temporary protected status, people with criminal convictions are excluded from the protection of temporary protected status. People who have what immigration law or an immigration judge interprets as a matter of immigration law as a particularly serious crime are excluded from the protection of asylum. People who cannot prove that they are being targeted for targeted persecution on account of race, religion, membership in a particular social group, nationality, or, um, or, <laughs> or political opinion are not covered by, by our protective system of asylum and withholding of removal. Therefore, somebody who is going and being sent back to Haiti who will face death but cannot prove that that person is targeting them because of one of those five protected categories, they are not protected by the legal system. And being a deportee from the United States has not been recognized by the courts repeatedly as being a protected social group, uh, a particular social group that warrants one, two protection. The protection under the Convention Against Torture, similarly, there is a case out of the Third Circuit, right? There are other cases where unless they can prove that the government or the actors, the state actors, are intending to commit torture, intending to commit torture for a reason, right, as a form of punishment, that does not qualify them for protection under the Convention Against Torture. And so while we are working to build systems of humane protection, we have to recognize that our current systems of protection in the United States do not protect individuals like Paul and, uh, and like Laura McMaster's husband who are being deported because of criminal convictions. And that is the reality. And so yes, we have these other systems in place. They are discretionary. If you have a criminal conviction, you don't have the opportunity of appealing to the circuit court unless you're proving a constitutional claim or a matter of statutory interpretation where the judge says, as a matter of discretion, I'm balancing all of these factors, and as a matter of discretion, I think you should be sent back, there is no federal court review of that. So we need to really be honest about what the systems of protection are. I'm going to send it to my colleagues, um, Daniel, to finish his testimony, and Geraldine has more to share as well. Thank you. Yeah, due to time, because if we were to go over and respond to uh, the government, we'll be here for the next year, until the end of the year. Um, honestly, uh, because of what we know and what we have heard, um, complete, you know, uh, uh, other way around. But to answer uh, uh, the commissioner on Paul Pierre Lewis, um he was found not being a flight risk or danger to the community. He served his time. Unfortunately, he went to a regular check-in when he was detained without giving access to get counsel. When we finally were able to, to get in touch with him, it was at the very last stage. And I need to add that even his congressman on that day was trying to communicate with the U.S. government, with ICE officers, with out having an answer and delay until he was deported, forcibly deported. And we also want to mention that the US can and must correct Paul's wrongful deportation by granting him humanitarian parole in light of the fact that his life is currently in danger. And I must say again, where he has been hiding because of fear of kidnapping and being killed was burned down. And that testimony was a result of that. I want to highlight very quickly manner of deportations. 
And we want to say that we appreciate the U.S. government for providing some type of access, including TPS. That was not a gift. We have to fight for over a year to prove the humanity of Haitians in order for that to happen. It was not a gift. It was a fight, and we won that fight on behalf of those vulnerable people. I want to also highlight the fact that um, repatriation and deportation, returning people to the very same danger they have fled, there's no humanity in that. I want to share one quick story of a young woman who was a part of one of the, uh, of the maritime, of, of, of the boats that came here, where we had to bury 11 women on the coast of Puerto Rico. I had to go physically bury them in Puerto Rico. And one of the survivors was transferred to a, to a, to a center in Texas and then to Berks County in Pennsylvania. While she was on suicide watch, on medication, was shackled and deported without any avenue to plead her case. She was found not credible even when she expressed the danger that she fled as a victim of rape and the fact that she barely survived the dangerous voyage that unfortunately the people who were with her did not survive. Highly medicated, on suicide watch, with what they believe to be a mental crisis, yet deported. And that's, these are the realities, and these are the cases, these are the people that we want to highlight their humanities and work with the US government to see what are the best courses to address those issues and make sure we are on the right side of history. Because we continue to say that protection delay is protection denied. Yeah, and just really quickly, I just wanted to highlight two minutes, yeah. You know, the United States coerces and forces black immigrants in detention, just like Paul, to accept that deportation. We have several examples, and we have pending complaints at the CRCL, Civil Liberties Office, that have not been addressed. We see situations where individuals are being forced to sign their deportations. Even while being placed on deportation flights, they are placed in chains for long periods of time, for over 16 hours, with their risk, their ankles, and their waist. This reminds us of slavery. And they're not given an opportunity to even eat. We have instances where individuals have been wrapped with a physical full body restraint at the 45 degree angles with their hands tied to their legs. This is inhumane. And these are the conditions and the realities that we have testimonies for. Therefore, again to add, protection delayed is protection denied. Humanity cannot be validated for some people and yet not be validated for others. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. I now invite the state to make your final statements for nine minutes. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to turn to Peter Mina from DHS for a few minutes for his comments. Madam President, distinguished commissioners, civil society organizations, secretariat staff, and colleagues, on behalf of the United States Department of Homeland Security, I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. My name is Peter Mina, and I currently serve as the DHS senior official performing the duties of the Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. In this role, I am designated by federal statute and executive order to protect civil rights and civil liberties and to help ensure the department upholds relevant U.S. international obligations. I and my staff at the DHS Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, or a CRCL, work to ensure humane treatment for all migrants, whether they are seeking entry or are already in the United States. We also work to ensure that the treatment of migrants is consistent with our domestic laws and international obligations. We appreciate the questions outlined about the treatment of Haitian migrants, both in Haiti and in the United States. DHS shares the concerns expressed about the ongoing unrest in Haiti and the impact on the lives of its citizens. We are also gravely concerned by the reports of abuses and poor conditions in Haitian prisons and have a strong interest in the fair treatment of Haitian nationals in the United States. DHS is committed to providing essential humanitarian protections to migrants, to complying with relevant U.S. international obligations, and to building a safe, orderly, and humane immigration system. Hearings like these help to inform and better shape DHS policies and activities. 
And that is part of our, our role as CRCLs in providing that advice to the department and its components. So we appreciate you raising these concerns. By way of response, I'd like to share some relevant information. First, I want to tell you more about our office of CRCL at, at DHS. And then my colleague, Daniel Delgado, from the DHS Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans, will discuss topics including the re recent notice of proposed rulemaking that will impact Haitian as well as other migrants seeking to enter the United States. To start with CRCL's role, CRCL works to ensure the integration of civil rights and civil liberties into all of DHS's policies, programs, and practices. CRCL also provides oversight of DHS components, along with other DHS offices, including the Office of the Inspector General, the Office of the Immigration Detention Ombudsman, and the and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Office of, Professional, Office of Professional Responsibility, among others. CRCL's compliance branch investigates complaints and provides recommendations directly to DHS components and offices and to address a concern raised by civil society. For example, CRCL's compliance branch has initiated a systemic review of ICE's New Orleans area of responsibility, focusing on, among other things, allegations of racially discriminatory treatment or abuse of black, of black detainees. Further, CRCL also has an open investigation into interdiction of maritime migrants and the protection screening, processing, and care of migrants interdicted at the Caribbean Sea. Anyone who wishes to file a complaint with CRCL's compliance sec branch can do so by emailing the complaint to crclcompliance at hq .dhs.gov. Again, that's crclcompliance at hq.dhs.gov. Overall, DHS aims to ensure that the individuals at risk of harm are protected. I thank you for this opportunity to address the commission, and now I'll turn to my colleague, Daniel Delgado, uh, for further comments. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to offer a few follow-up remarks and explain where we, at, where we are on a couple of pressing issues. As of today, along the southwest border, uh, DHS continues to, to prepare for the lifting of the Title 42 public health order, uh, which is expected at the end of May 11th, or at, yes, at the end of May 11th, 2023, and the return to processing all non-citizens under our Title 8 immigration authorities. Until then, the Title 42 order remains in effect, and DHS is required to implement it. As we said before, Title 42 is not an immigration authority, but it is a public health authority. DHS continues to process humanitarian exceptions to this public health order on a case-by-case -case basis. And on January 5th, DHS announced a new mechanism in which non-citizens in Mexico of any nationality seeking a humanitarian exception may schedule an online appointment to present at a port of entry via the CBP-1 mobile application. This app is free and available for download to any smartphone or tablet. It is now also available in Haitian Creole, among other languages. Once the Title 42 order is lifted, DHS intends to widen the use of this app to allow any non-citizen, not just those presently seeking Title 42 exceptions, to access our ports of entry in a safe and orderly fashion. Since the process started on January 18th, Haitians have consistently been one of the top nationalities to both successfully schedule an appointment while using the CBP-1 app and be processed into the United States at ports of entry. As Peter briefly mentioned, recently the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice uh, issued a proposed rule to incentivize the use of new and existing lawful processes and disincentivize dangerous border crossing in between ports of entry by placing a new condition on asylum eligibility for those who attempt to enter the United States without authorization. Consistent with America's history as a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants, this proposed rule ensures enforcement of U.S. immigration law, promotes lawful pathways, and provides access to asylum and other forms of humanitarian relief for those who need it. The proposed rule is currently open to public comment for 30 days. And for that reason, it is not appropriate for me to discuss uh, in context or at length the proposed rule or receive detailed input. However, all comments are welcome uh, to be submitted in writing to www.regulations.gov through the end of the comment period on Monday, March 27th. As mentioned, while DHS has been required by court order to enforce the Title 42 public health order, Haitians have consistently accounted for a significant percentage of humanitarian exceptions to that order to include the recent adoption of CBP-1. Since that announcement, we've seen great demand uh, in the Haitian community on both the supporter side um, as well as Haitians abroad for more information to which we have been sharing regarding our parole processes as well as the uh, humanitarian exception process. Conversely, uh, an increasing number of Haitians continue to avail themselves of those safe and orderly processes that we've established, 
as we uh, have established, and as a result, expulsions of Haitian nationals to Mexico have remained low under the Title 42 Public Health Order. Similarly, when we return to processing all non-citizens under Title 8 authorities, including Haitians, DHS will continue to use expedited removal, which allow for the prompt removal of those who do not claim a fear of persecution or torture, or who are determined not to have a credible fear uh, after an interview with an asylum officer with USCIS in accordance with established procedures. It is important to note that if an increasing number of Haitians choose to not avail, them, avail themselves of these orderly and lawful processes and enter the United States without authorization, the overall number of those being removed will also likely increase as a result. This further underscores the importance of DHS's efforts to establish safe, lawful, and orderly processes for migrants to come to the United States, further disincentivizing non-citizens from making the dangerous journeys as we've described today to our borders, whether in the maritime context or the land ports of entry and in between land ports of entry, and ultimately build an immigration system that enforces our laws and holds true to our values as a nation. Thank you again for the opportunity to address this commission. Madam Chair. I just want to close. I just wanted to thank you and the members of the commission for the opportunity to testify and also thank civil society for, for being here and testifying as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. I just wanted to remind you of the time left. <laughs> thank you. Um, it is now my, <clears throat> my duty to close this hearing. Um, I just have a couple of comments to make. One is that um, the subject of, of migrants' rights is extremely difficult. We all accept that and know this. Um, but I had to serve in the capacity of rapporteur for several months some years ago. And it was the most grueling and upsetting and both mentally, emotionally, and otherwise uh, um, months I've had, in addition to my other rapporteurships. And I promised myself that I would not do it again. And I also had the task of being in a delegation of the commission when we visited three uh, um, migrant areas in the southwest coast of Mexico and um, detention centers. I'm afraid I find it difficult to use those terms because they are prisons uh, um, from our visits to very many of them. They are definitely prisons, they're not detention centers, at least not in an English-trained lawyer's sense of understanding of a detention center. And I have the, I'm concerned when we heard these, these videos, and also from what I discovered talking to those who were in, in detention and in the US custody in those places. Um, about seeming in the lack of strict due process when it came to migrants, uh, um, of, of hopeful migrants, refugees, those who hope for asylums, and so on. Because the, the rules seem to be disbelief of, of their, their statements of why they were, find themselves in that position of wishing to enter the United States. And I wanted to ask in relation to these videos, do you not have the principle of rehabilitation after somebody who has been convicted of a criminal act, uh, um, especially those categorized as nonviolent and you will not be danger to society and so on, when they have served their sentence, do you not have that principle and apply it? Uh, um, because most common law countries do, uh, and, and I am surprised that the United States in this, the, these two cases seem not to have considered that at all. And I'm concerned about what seems to be this absolute or, or excessive autonomy of ICE and ICE agents, because no common commonwealth and I mean English Commonwealth, common law country, would deport anyone, anyone at all, without a lawful, legal hearing in a court of law and based on an order of a court of law. So I, I, I hope you can explain further what is happening 
in the United States because, as you say, you are known of, as a country of laws. And, and, and in this regard, with people running away from humanitarian crisis, which forced them to leave their homes, it is not an easy decision for anyone to take. Mm -hmm. There ought to be the strictest adherence to due process of law before they are deported. And uh, this is my opinion. Um, could you please uh, let us have your, your submissions today in writing so that we can uh, um, closely follow them and answers, more detailed answers as well. And the same with you. Um, and to continue a civil society to provide us with the information as, as time goes on. And we hope that we will have another hearing of this kind because <clears throat> migration is not going away because of the state of the world. And so therefore we should have more hearings on this issue and for these very unfortunate people. With that, I thank you, civil society, for your presentation and your request of this hearing. And I thank the United States for being here with such a high level delegation. And I thank you all for being present in person. And I thank those who are online for listening to this. And finally, but not least, I thank the interpreters for assisting us to understand the whole process. Thank you. This hearing is at an end.